Well, good morning, Walden Church. Happy patriotic celebration. Happy 4th of July. I hope you all had a wonderful 4th holiday. Uh, July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence. That's what we celebrate, giving the United States independence from Great Britain. Uh, July 4th is also known as Independence Day or the birthday of America. And the day is filled with patriotism. American flags, they're flown with pride all through our neighborhood, all across the United States. Uh, July 4th represents our gratitude to our founding fathers for giving us something that oftentimes we take for granted, our freedom. So my question to you today is this, what's your go-to food? <laughs> what's your go-to food or drink for a 4th of July celebration? What do, you, what do you love? What do you have to have? Is it barbecue, right? You got a grill, hot dogs? Is it chip and dip? Is it uh, uh, maybe grandma? Maybe she makes a cake that's shaped like the American flag and it's got three layers, right? For red, white, and blue. Is it like strawberry, vanilla, and blueberry? And you just have to have it, otherwise it's not 4th of July. What do we all look forward to the most? Is it the parade, speeches, the fireworks? I love all the holidays, but there is something special about the 4th of July that just makes it that much more great. Maybe it's the reason that we celebrate 4th of July. Maybe it's because I love to see the fireworks in the sky. Maybe it's all the good food. But why do we celebrate that way? You ever wonder? Like, why do we celebrate with parades and fireworks and barbecues? A lot of people think that it has something to do with a letter that John Adams, one of our founding fathers, wrote to his wife, Abigail, July 3rd, 1776. He writes, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable day in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. Well, there it is, right? That's your to-do list. Those are the things we need to celebrate with every single year. Later, on August 2nd, 1776, our forefathers, along with John Adams, signed the Declaration of Independence. And from that founding document, we get this most famous of lines. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so on the 4th of July, we celebrate freedom. We celebrate liberty. We celebrate our independence. And it's a day to relish the actual physical freedom that we can have together, just like we're celebrating right now, like in a church, worshiping our creator. And there's actually a very similar sounding creed that we also say in the Pledge of Allegiance. We say that we are one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Do you know the Pledge of Allegiance was actually written for a children's magazine called Youth's Companion, and it was written by a Baptist minister named Francis Bellamy in 1892. Now the pledge was written 116 years after the Declaration of Independence. Youth Companion magazine was selling American flags to schools, and they were celebrating the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus arriving in America, and they wanted a pledge to go along with their advertising campaign. But that first pledge that Francis Bellamy wrote looked 
very different when it was first written in 1892. And can you imagine what two words were added 62 years later? Under God. Under God. On Lincoln Sunday, in a sermon preached at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., the Reverend George Dougherty proposed adding those two words, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance. And wouldn't you know it, President Eisenhower was in church that day, so the sermon received national news, received coverage. Five months later, the new pledge, with those two new words added, was being recited in Congress. Pastor Dougherty's edit is a reminder to all that we are one nation under God. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it awesome that the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a pastor and it was revised 62 years later by a second pastor? So today I want to look just at that isolated section of text. One nation under God. We, we've said it for so long, maybe we're beginning to forget what it means. What does it have to say about us as a nation? And what does it say about God and his relationship to us? What does it say about nationality and patriotism? Well, let's look at each part of it one phrase at a time. We are one nation, right? One nation. Very early on in the scriptures, we see Abraham receive a covenant promise from God. And God says in Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. All through the ancient scriptures that we call the Old Testament, the Jews are known as God's children. They are his people. They are a holy nation. They are the chosen people. And several times throughout the Old Testament, we see this blessing from God given. Here it is again, just worded a little differently in Genesis chapter 18. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Now, you can imagine that a statement like that, like this, would go to your head. You know, all the nations will be blessed because of your nation. And the blessing did come true. Israel did become a great and powerful nation. In war, nobody could defeat them. In riches and power, Israel became very strong. But while the Hebrews fulfilled their calling to be a powerful nation, there was another aspect of that blessing that they forgot. Listen to this passage in Exodus chapter 19. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So not just a powerful nation, but also a holy nation. Not just a kingdom of warriors and a kingdom of soldiers, but also a kingdom of priests. So what is a priest? Well, a priest is a representative of God, right? In religion, if you want to know what a particular God looks like or what the religion looks like, you would look to the priest as being the example. The priest is a servant, but they are also a symbol of their faith. Israel was puffed up, and they had this promise they were going to be the chosen people, the chosen nation. They were the children of Abraham, and so they were puffed up with ego. They couldn't look past their own fame and glory, and they had forgotten the promise that they were supposed to be a blessing to other nations. And instead of being a kingdom of priests, they had just resided to being a kingdom. But that was never God's plan for them. Listen to what God says through the prophet Isaiah. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. This is God's kingdom. This is what it means to be a part of God's vision. And his vision 
is for who? Who is God's kingdom for? What does the text say? It says, all who are thirsty. And how much will this blessing cost them? The text says nothing. God says his favor is for all and it's free. What else does he say? Verse two says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. So here is an everlasting promise. The Old Testament blessed and bestowed upon the kingdom of Israel, and it's now being offered to everyone. The first agreement to Israel, that promise, that handshake is now available to all, and it's free. It's absolutely free. Verse four says, see, I have made him a witness to the people, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations who know you not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. God says to Israel, he says, because of this promise, because of our relationship, nations that you don't even know, people groups that you've never heard of, they're gonna come running to your shores because your beauty will attract who? Everyone who is thirsty. And then listen to this very familiar passage. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is an often misquoted verse. You know, when something weird happens or a death happens or something we can't explain, you might hear Christians say, well, the Lord moves in strange and mysterious ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. But that's not how the text is used here. Because you see, in ancient times, when Isaiah 55 was written, a kingdom protected its own border. And you would protect what was yours, right? You would defend what was yours. You built your empire by crushing other nations. And then once you had more, you built a wall around it. This is the type of kingdom that David's son, Solomon built. First Kings 9 says, here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon's conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. How did Solomon build his empire? How did Solomon build his kingdom? The Bible says forced labor. What is forced labor? Slaves. The nation who had once been slaves themselves in Egypt for hundreds of years have now forgotten their own national history. And they had forgotten their calling. They are to be a kingdom of priests. They are to be a holy nation. And now they are using slaves to build their mighty kingdom. Rosa Parks said, I'd like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free and wanted other people to be also free. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, that's how you do it, but that's not how I do it. Your ways are not my ways. My way is anyone who is thirsty can come running. Anyone who needs blessing, it's theirs for the asking and it's totally free. You build your reputation on the backs of slavery, but my hope is to set the captives free. And God says that his way is so much different than our way. And that the difference between how God does things and how people do things, God says is the difference between the earth and the sky. 
right, between our planet and the sun. And today, as Christians, we are still supposed to be on mission. As followers of God, we are still imbued with this calling to be a kingdom of priests, one nation, right? One nation, a holy nation. And of course, we should be proud. There's nothing wrong with being patriotic or or recognizing how blessed we are, especially to live in the land of the free, the home of the brave. Just so long as we don't forget to be God's representatives to the world, to not build our empire on the backs of slaves, and to be a light on a hill that calls out to any who are thirsty, even from shores and nations we have never heard of. The Declaration of Independence says this knowledge is self-evident. That means it's a no-brainer, right? It doesn't need any explanation. It's apparent to everyone that all people are created and all people are given rights by God to life and liberty. And as Americans, and as we celebrate the 4th of July, we need to remember that. This means that the freedom that you enjoy right now to congregate, to vote, to exercise your freedom of speech, Even the fact that you have access to clean drinking water, that you have a livable wage, that you have a government that looks out for your best interests, those freedoms that we believe as Americans are owed and deserved to each and every person on the face of the earth, regardless of how they look, how old they are, or where they were born. President George Washington says, observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. On July 4th, our forefathers said that these were certain self-revealing truths. And among them was the glaring fact that we are all created equal. How? In the image of God. All people have the right to life and freedom and the pursuit of happiness because we're all God's children. That sounds a lot like what we are reading in Isaiah chapter 55, doesn't it? Come all who are thirsty, come from nations that we know not and you will share in this covenant. We are one nation. We are one nation and we are also under God. The prophet Jeremiah says that there will come a day when Jerusalem, the throne of the Lord, and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. So that means there is a prophecy that one day all nations, the whole earth, everyone will honor God. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. Every knee bow, every tongue confess. Psalm 22 says, For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Notice the language there. God rules over the nations. Zechariah 14 says, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name the only name. Psalm 113, The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Scripture clearly says that God is over the nations. And uh, American historical documents, they all agree, correct? We describe ourselves as a nation under God. So he is over and we are under. That means God is not in first place and we are second. Okay, God is not first and nation second. It's God over Nation under. One word the Hebrew Bible uses to talk about God's rule over the nation or over the earth is the word mashal. Mashal is sometimes translated as governor or dominion or to rule over. And this is because the nations of the earth, the earth in its entirety, belongs to God. 
So a country that is under God is ruled by God. And I think we need to have that understanding. That understanding is crucial. We can't afford to become like the kingdom of Israel where we elevate our kingdom to be equal with God. And we say, well, God is in first place and we're in second place. And we can't build our palaces and our temples and our walls on the backs of the nations that we forget. Because the Bible says all nations belong to God. We are all made in God's image. We are all one nation. David writes in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That means if we are truly going to live out the Pledge of Allegiance in our lives, and if we are truly going to celebrate and honor the Declaration of Independence, celebrate July 4th, we have to live as one nation under God. A nation owned by God, a nation ruled by God, and a nation that honors God by bestowing blessings, yes, even on nations we have never heard of. Let's remember the promise of Abraham is to be a blessing to all nations because that is the blessing that is fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. In Matthew 22, the religious experts, they ask Jesus, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And how does Jesus respond? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. Jesus says we are to love God. That's the first and greatest commandment. And later, he says, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Later in chapter 28, Jesus follows up with this great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These are marching orders from Jesus to make disciples of who? All nations. That's the good news. The good news is that God loves all his children, all nations. He offers salvation to all people, to anyone who is thirsty, that he forgives a world of sin. Isaiah 55 is that same good news of God. God's call is to anyone who is thirsty, right? How much does the blessing cost? Nothing. God says his favor is free. It's just like that old hymn that we used to sing as kids growing up says, and Jesus says, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty. You won't be denied. When we make disciples of all nations, when we immerse them in Jesus, then we are acting as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Jesus even tells us how to do this in Matthew 22. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because when we can do that, when we can love our neighbor as ourself, then we live a life that honors all people. Then we live a life that honors all people that are made in the image of God. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we admit we are all created equal. It's self-evident. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Jesus said all of the law and all of the prophets were summed up in these commands. You love God and you love others. That should be the summary of everything we do as Christians. That should be the summary of everything we do at our churches. Love God and love others. Whatever program our church makes, whatever class our church teaches, whatever act of service our church does, 
any song that we sing, any dollar that is given, any hand that is extended, any body, any human that is embraced, it should all be done under the umbrella of the command, we love God and we love others. Because let me tell you something. If it's not love God, love others, then it's not Christian. And to fail to love like Jesus is the worst form of heresy. No matter how right your beliefs are, it only makes sense that the gospel is just as simple now than it ever has been. Love God, love others. A couple weeks ago, we read John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Bible tells us that Jesus is full of grace and he's full of truth. And believe me, I know that is so difficult to be both. It seems so much easier to just be full of truth, to push the truth, to hold people to the truth, to judge with the truth. But the Bible says we are also to be people of grace. We can't be just one or the other. If we're just people of grace, then we're not being honest. We're not being truth-filled. We're not holding people to be accountable for their actions. But if we're also just full of truth, then we end up being hard-hearted and unmerciful. We need to be people who display both. And that comes across in Jesus' mandate. Love God, love others. Remember, God's universal call is to everyone. Anyone who is thirsty. And it's free. His favor, his, his blessing upon blessing, his grace upon grace is free. This July 4th, let's remember that we also have a patriotic duty to God. We are his kingdom. We are his nation. We are one nation and we are under him. And if we're to live as a kingdom of priests, if we're to live as a holy nation, a nation under God, we need to be people that continue to model this command from Jesus. Jesus modeled a life of loving God, loving others. You will never see him do anything else but Jesus is never off-brand. He's never off-mission. He loved the world so much, the Bible says he gave his life for it. You know, young people are always asking where the line in the sand is. Which team do I go with? Which side do I stand on? And how far is too far before I cross a line and it becomes sin? Jesus said in Luke 11, knowing their thoughts. He said, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided house falls. The book of Romans says, I appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Do you know where sin starts? Do you know where sin begins to creep into your life? It begins when we draw a line in the sand, when we stand on one side or the other. Sin begins when we point fingers at our neighbor. Sin begins where we, when we choose sides, or we say, it's not my fault, it's those people over there. Sin begins when there becomes those people or that group. The Bible says if we're not together, Jesus says if we're not together, we're divided. And that is where the devil does his best work. And don't think this is only a verse for the church. Don't think this is only a passage or a mandate for Christians. This is for the entire world. This is for all of us. This is for July 4th. This is for Americans. Clarence Darrow said, true patriotism hates injustice in its own land 
more than anywhere else. To get through this, we need to be together. All of us. We can't get through anything without each other. And we can get through anything if we can remember that we are one nation under God. This is why Jesus came to die. He didn't come to die to divide us into little churches and little denominations where we squabble over Bible translations. He came to unite us. Jesus unites us and sets us free. Condoleezza Rice said the essence of America, that which really unites us, is not ethnicity or nationality or religion. It is an idea. And what the idea it is, that you can come from a humble circumstance and do great things, that it doesn't matter where you came from, but where you are going. Friends, 4th of July, let's agree that we're going to listen to each other and that we're going to be open to loving each other even across lines of nationality, even across lines of party, even across lines of denomination, even across lines of age or lines of wealth, those lines only separate us. They only divide us. Gerald Stanley Lee says, America is a tune and it must be sung together. Jesus said, a house divided falls. 4th of July, let's not forget. We are one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the birth of this great nation. And right now, in 2020, we celebrate, and yet our hearts are still broken. We feel the division that is being pulling on us. We feel the separation between our brother and our sister. We ask that you would heal this nation, continue to bring us closer together. May we not squabble and fight and bicker, but may we extend hands across the table in love. May we pull up every line that would divide us. We are stronger together. We are stronger united. Lord, we also ask that you would heal this land physically. There are people and friends and neighbors that are sick. There are people in our communities that are dying. We would ask that you would heal this nation. Heal Montgomery. Heal Texas. Heal the United States. Heal this world because we are all your sons and daughters. We are all made in your image. We are all your children. And as our hearts would break for those who are sick in America, our hearts break for those who are sick all over this world. We know that you would not want to see anyone perish. Give our doctors and nurses wisdom. Give our first responders strength encouraged to continue to go. We are so grateful for them. We are proud of each and every one of them. Continue to walk with your church and help her to be an instrument of truth in this world. May your church stand for everything that is right and true and good and to never back down. But may your church also be an instrument of grace. May your church be the place where people run to to find shelter and forgiveness and love. And may we as your Christians, as your disciples, as your followers, continue to be instruments of love. May we learn to love the way your son first loved. And may we show grace upon grace, blessing upon blessing to everyone. Thank you so much for the 4th of July, for Independence Day, for being one nation under God, And thank you for each and every good thing. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this service. I hope you had a wonderful and safe 4th of July weekend. 
I love you guys so much. Continue to be safe. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Please wear a mask when you go out and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.